Bible, um, okay, some, somebody, uh, let's work together here on some things. Somebody tell me the difference between a translation and a transliteration. <laughs> any, any guesses, ideas? Is that one uh, word for word and the other one uh, meaning? Where they change the, the meaning of close, it? Close, close. Okay. Real close. Uh, translation is where you take a, what you described, you take a word in one language called the donor language and you find the closest word in the receptor language. Um, yeah. Uh, anybody else ideas? What, what's a transliteration instead of a translation? What's that? Not quite phrase for phrase. It's actually uh, uh, here's a word that's transliterated. Um, amen. Amen is a transliterated word. What you're doing is you're not, you're, you have the donor language and you have this word in the donor language, but there's no word that you like in the receptor language. So you just create a new word altogether. Oh. So you just, you take uh, amen or, or sela or sila from the book of Psalms. Um, Maybe because we don't know exactly what it means, or maybe they just, uh, I think of in the New Testament, Maranatha, right? That's a, or uh, what's Galatians say? If anybody preaches a different gospel, let them be anathema. It's just taking a word from another language and just using it, sometimes for the strength of it. That when translators saw it, they didn't feel like there was a, a strong enough word for it. Um, and so we talked before about, you know, English translators. Sometimes the first English translator to translate something it's hard to move away from it. When we do the Christmas series, we'll talk about the King James translated that Mary and Joseph, there was no room for them in the inn. And that's just not a good translation. Um, and so we're going to talk about that. What did it look like? We'll take you to a first century home that probably is a better accurate understanding. Sometimes the first one to the punch wins. One of the words that I, you know, I... I when I talk about how I wish translators would have done something, I say that with a grain of salt because they're all smarter than me and the, the modern translations we have are great. But one of the things I don't love about most modern English translations is when you come to the Old Testament and you have the word like Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's the, that's the word Yahweh, that's the personal name for God. And then Adonai is also L-O-R-D, but it's not capital O-R-D. And there's a long story about why they did that, but the name of Yahweh, they didn't want to say it out loud. Um, even when they would, they would write it, the, the copiers later, they would, they would never want to, um, they wouldn't want to, let, there's this statement that the master eats when they were copying, when you, co when you write the name, God's personal name, Yahweh, even if a, a king addresses you as you're writing his name, don't acknowledge the king. It's such a holy name. But instead of translating, I wish, I wish they'd transliterate that and call it Yahweh um, instead of using Lord, but that's a, whole, that's a whole different topic. But the word amen, uh, the word deacon, the word deacon is a transliterated word. It just means servant. And we've transliterated it, and some churches created it into this op bigger office than I think the New Testament ever intended. Um, and there's, there's another one we'll talk about in a little bit. <clears throat> Let's talk about uh, mikvahs. Have we been, have we taken you to a mikvah yet? I can't remember. A mikvah. Do you want to know what a mikvah is? It's a ceremonial bath that they would use. They use uh, what what kinds of things would you use a ceremonial bath for in Jewish culture? Wash before eating. Wash before eating. Well, you'd usually pour over. Okay. Uh, mikvah would be the whole body. So it would be like a woman after her period. A uh, man after having sexual intercourse, uh, late, in later times, the uh, Jewish leaders had them, you'd, you'd purchase utensils and you'd immerse them first. Before you go up to the temple, you would you'd go through a mikvah. There are all kinds of reasons to go through anything you did that was called impure in the Old Testament, that it was a ceremonial cleansing, you would go through a mikvah. Um, and that is a household mikvah. So... Um, and you'll, you'll get a chance, you can, you can after I'm, when, before we leave here, you can walk around and, and take some photos. But basically, you would you'd come down here into this mikvah, and you would you'd disrobe. There should be nothing between your body and, and the water. Uh, you would disrobe. Oh, some, another one would be if, um, if a Gentile became a Jew, part of the process was to go through a mikvah. There's, uh, there's over 200 mikvahs. 
uh, in Jerusalem that have been discovered, and 50 of them very close to the temple, because you always went to the mikvah, not by Old Testament command, but by Jewish tradition, by the time of Jesus and Mary, you go through the mikvah. So there'd be somewhere here, you'd, you'd lay down, of course, these walls were higher, your neighbors weren't staring in at you, and you'd, you'd lay your clothing aside, and you'd walk down, you'd fully immerse yourself, and then you'd come back up. And it was a ceremonial cleansing. Um, John the Baptist took it and, and changed its meaning a little bit and made it more about a baptism of repentance. Not a ceremonial cleansing, but a cleansing of the heart, um, which is the start of, of our baptism that, that we use. And, and baptize. So we're going to see a lot of mikvahs when we get near Jerusalem, but this households would, uh, would put mikvahs in if they're able to. And ideally it's spring fed. In fact, probably the most, the best preserved spring fed mikvah is uh, in Magdala while, where we're staying. It's really pretty amazing. Uh, when we walk around that, we'll show it to you. But um, <clears throat> baptize is one of those transliterated words that, uh, and it's really interesting how it happened. Because if they had translated the word, the, he, the Greek word baptizo into English, um, it would not be baptized. That's transliterated. Does that make sense? If they had translated it, it would be immerse, dip, submerge. The difficulty is when you've been commissioned by uh, King James to translate the Bible, and uh, he's part of the Church of England that does not immerse, you don't want to translate the word baptizmo. You want to transliterate it. So the first English, trans the earliest, not the first, well, certainly the first two, but the earliest of English translations, they transliterated, they created a new English word rather than translate what it is. That, you know, you should, uh, you should immerse, you should, should submerge, you should place under the water. They just transliterated it um, because that was their practice, to sprinkle. And if you translated it, it kind of messed up what you were doing. And then the problem is, future translations, if any modern translation translated it instead of transliterated it, there's going to be a whole section of Christianity that will never buy your translation. So they're not going to do it. They're just going to, we're going to stick with baptism. It's, uh, it's an interesting, interesting situation. I wish they would, if they had, if the earliest of English translations had translated it instead of transliterated it, it would probably be a little easier. But it's also interesting that different, um, then therefore, different cultures, how they translate. Some some cultures in their uh, translations do translate it immerse, but I was talking to uh, a guide recently who is Russian, and he said that in the Russian language, the translations say crucify. It's That's the word they use, that their baptism word is crucify. That it's uh, crucifying yourself, dying with Christ, which is, not a bad image too. Um, but in, in Jewish culture, there was this call for ceremonial cleansing as a, a reminder that we need to be cleansed. And uh, it was a command of what they were to do in several places. You will read that in the Old Testament. <clears throat> uh, mikvahs became so important in the Jewish culture that they would require a mikvah to be in a culture before a synagogue. Uh, that's how significant it was to have uh, to have a mikvah in your culture. This one was part of a, a family's courtyard, so some families were able to have mikvahs. Well, um, depending on where we, all the places we get to in Jerusalem, we can get uh, even near uh, the home of, was it the high priest or several priests? And there were just a lot of mikvahs because priests were going through there, and before they went up to the temple to do their duties, they would go through a mikvah. And of course, then Jesus, John the Baptist, uh, we don't know when this happened uh, between the Testaments that it became, the emphasis was uh, probably how it, I, I don't know, I'm really, I'm really am taking a guess, but probably the way it happened was this idea of rather than just going through this ritual, this habit that people were in and satisfying themselves with it, John the Baptist or forerunners of John the Baptist said, no, there needs to be a heart issue here that you're saying, I long, I know I need to be cleansed. I want my heart right with God. Um, and then, of course, Jesus took that and said, now it should happen once we receive Christ, go into all nations, and then we baptize them into all nations. Uh, no need to go through a ritual bath. But there is this, again, There's a it's the Eastern world, so we give pictures for things. 
and place people under the water as a symbol of I have now died with Christ and I'm living with Christ. I'm living differently. There's nothing spiritual that happens inside of you, but you are providing this picture, this moment of saying, I am devoted to Jesus. I'm going public with who I am and I am a follower of Christ. And so we immerse, we get immersed in water and we come up again as a sign of I have died with Christ. I believed in him, which is my death and my resurrection depends on him. Uh, but that's the, that's the symbol here of, of the mikvah and, and why it was important to them and the, um, and the picture that we have and how we've changed it from what the Old Testament was. Jesus transitioned it um, to John made it a baptism of repentance. Jesus talked about a baptism that illustrates the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And it's what people are commanded to do today. Uh, but we'll see a lot of mikvahs in whether it's homes or around the temple for sure we'll see some there too let me take you over to uh, if you want to i'll walk slowly so if people want to come around and get a picture of this mikvah this one had a pretty fancy rock stone covering that they would have covered with um, with other things to be able to cover it completely but if you want to grab a picture of the mikvah then um, i'll walk slowly over here to the courtyard we're going to stop at two more places uh, so you can think of this as like the town marketplace here. Come in here and buy and sell goods. Also, um, the, the way, one thing to just consider how buildings, families were, were built. Um, family homes were very small. A typical home was uh, a couple of rooms. In one room is where you ate, slept, lived. And then a second room was often a guest room that would be used for guests. You don't have these multiple... You know, every, every home that all of us live in was, is nothing compared to what they lived in. Typically a, a two room house and one you did everything in. Um, and then what you do is when your son got married, so your son decides he's gonna get married, he would go and, and he would, uh, dad and son would go and meet with dad and daughter and there'd be a, an agreement, a bride price. She was worth so much. There'd be a bride price that was agreed to. She agreed to the wedding. The dad agreed to the wedding. They usually didn't know each other real well. This was parental arrangement. Uh, they, in most Jewish cultures, depending on the part of, of Israel they lived in, uh, they wouldn't spend time alone together um, before the wedding. Often, you know, they didn't, they did not know each other well by the time they got married. And, um, but then what would happen is often after the engagement, then the son would go home during this engagement period and he would add on to his father's house. So what would end up happening is we were standing where we just were, where the mikvah was, that would be like the courtroom of the larger family home. And then this son is married and he has a one or two room house over here off the courtyard and mom and dad have, and you just build onto your father's house uh, was a typical, again, this is, a, here's an old translation thing. Um, where Jesus said he's going and creating a mansion for us. You know, that, at least that's the mind picture I had. I wonder where my mansion's going to be. And where, you know, where's my family's mansion going to be? No, the, the new translations say this one right. I, I go and prepare a place for you, a room for you. It's the picture they would have of, of a groom that's, there's the engagement has happened. Now he's going back to his father's house to add on to his father's house. And then he'll come to you for the wedding and take you to be with me where I am. You know, we think about the heaven concept and that's very true, but the picture of it is what they lived every day of their lives in this culture. That you'd add to your father's house, then you'd go, the engagement would be over, you'd go get married, and then you'd move back in and you'd have a courtroom that you'd share with the extended family and uh, you and your wife would have your own living quarters there that could keep expanding as the family grew perhaps. That's more of the, of the concept. And you see all these homes. We are in a courtyard there with some, and there's, yeah, courtyards and family homes here throughout. Okay, we're gonna go here. They're, they're working, but hopefully there'll be a place here. I'd love to talk in here, even though it'll be a little noisy. I want you to see, this is another synagogue. So let's walk this way. This is a synagogue from the uh, fourth century. Um, again, new synagogues tend to be built on old synagogues. There are three cities that, that were told in the New Testament Jesus taught. Um, three cities that he performed more miracles than any other. Capernaum, where we just were, and this is city number two, Chorazin. Um, and then we'll go to Bethsaida, hopefully tomorrow. Um, so, uh, okay, so tell me where Jerusalem is. 
Yeah, yeah, this is another one that's facing south for us so that we can see Jerusalem. Not all of them do that, but it's the, it's the preferred. If you have a Bible, I would love you to look at Luke 4. As you're turning there, help me help me understand what's the difference between a temple, temple and a synagogue, the temple and the synagogue. What's the difference? One temple. Good, good. How many synagogues were there? A lot. Yes. You want them in every town that you could put them in. What what happened? What was the difference about what happened in a temple compared to a synagogue? What happened to the temple? Sacrifices. Yeah, sacrifices. What happened in a synagogue? Sacrifices? Why not? Not allowed. There's only one place you could offer sacrifices, and that was at the place God chose. He talks about it starting in the book of Deuteronomy. You'll come to the place I choose. He hadn't chosen it yet. In fact, he didn't choose it until the time of David, a thousand years before Christ. And then from then on, that was to be the only place. The reason the Jewish Orthodox Jews today don't do sacrifices is they don't have the temple. It doesn't belong to them. It's the Muslims that have it. And that's why they pray at the Western Wall, because it's the closest they can get to the temple. Um, Okay, synagogue. What kinds of things happen at the synagogue? Yeah, teaching. Good. What else? What marriage? Okay, what else? Okay, yeah, what else? It was like uh, the school I mentioned earlier. It's uh, the school rooms. Uh, it would be a courthouse, town hall, that kind of thing. But on the Sabbath, from sundown Friday till sundown Saturday, it was a place of teaching and worship. So... <clears throat> Jesus, remember, was a traveling rabbi. He would travel town to town. And I want to tell you a story. It didn't happen here, but this helps us because this is a developed enough synagogue with a, a couple of things that can be helpful. But the most important part of a synagogue was that it was for the reading and teaching of the Jewish scriptures. <clears throat> so Jesus, as a traveling rabbi, would show up in town, and because he was a well-known figure, became a well-known figure, his teaching was incredibly authoritative. You were in town, people would say, why don't you teach here? So he would teach in the synagogue. Now, uh, Luke, Acts 15, let me, let me read this to you, and this will make a little more sense here in a bit. Acts 15, 21, the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So that's what they would do. They would go to the Sabbath, the law of Moses, the law and the prophets, there would be a specific reading, probably a, a liturgical reading that would be given, and they would read from it. And then, and then the teacher, the traveling rabbi or that synagogue's rabbi would teach from it. So every synagogue uh, had a synagogue leader. It didn't have to be from the tribe of Levi. There was just a synagogue leader. Um, and then there was a rabbi. And then also there was an attendant that handled the scrolls. <clears throat> Depending on what day we're near the Western Wall, when we get to Jerusalem, we may see a scroll cabinet that holds the scrolls. And it's pretty, if you can get down at the Western Wall and see it on uh, at a, a time of a bar mitzvah, it's pretty incredible to watch them pull out these huge scrolls. And then, you know, the, the boy has to read from the scroll. But it's it's pretty amazing. So, <clears throat> the, the Sabbath they gathered together, and then th this is, um, then what would happen is the teacher would, the attendant would uh, pull out the reading from the scroll from that day. They'd pull it out of the cabinet. It would be uh, laid out on a table that you'd put the scroll on and then the official reading would take place. Then they'd roll up the scroll, they would put it away, and then the teacher sat down. But they didn't sit down in their seat, they sat down in a seat of authority. It was called the seat of Moses. And in a few days we're going to go to um, the Israel Museum in Jerusalem and you're going to see the actual seat of Moses from, from this synagogue. But they have a recreation of it uh, right over, right over here. Samuel, hop up on that seat for me. Yeah, that's the seat of Moses. You see it? That it wouldn't be sitting there. That would be the wall of the synagogue. But the seat of Moses, where they're working, is where they're going to replace the seat of Moses. That's where it normally sits. But they put it on the wall while they're recreating that. Um, and so you can take a picture of that. That is a recreation of the seat of Moses. You'll see in the Israel Museum. I would advise you, if you want to sit in the seat of Moses, do it here, not the Israel Museum. <laughs> no problem if you do it there. Uh, but that's where the teacher would then sit and instruct. They didn't stand and instruct, they would sit and instruct. So, with all that in mind, let's look at Luke chapter 4. Thanks, Sam. Okay, verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. News about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. So he comes back to the Galilee region. This was after being tempted in the wilderness. 
he's this traveling rabbi, uh, very popular, everyone praised him, verse 15 says, then 16. He went to Nazareth. So we drove by Nazareth. We were, uh, we were in Sephora's yesterday, and Nazareth was three or four miles up over the other hill. That's where Jesus spent the first 30 years of his life, mostly. And uh, he goes back to that town. And that's one of the towns in Galilee. So it said he would go in throughout the region of Galilee, teaching, healing the sick. So he'd go back to the hometown. Um, verse 15, he was teaching in their synagogues. Everyone praised him. Uh, 16, he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. So he's a traveling rabbi. Every time there's a Sabbath, whatever town he's in, he'd go to the synagogue because he's a popular teacher. They'd say, whoa, Jesus is here. Let's have him do the reading and teaching today. Um, so in the verse 16, it says, he stood up to read. That's what you would do. So the attendant would have handed Jesus this scroll. He'd lay it out on the table in front of him. Uh, likely, likely men sitting on one side, women on the other. Now watch what happens next. This is incredible. Verse 17. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. So he was handed that scroll. We don't know if it was part of the liturgy. This is what was being read in all the synagogues. We don't know why. Did he ask for that? We don't know. But he was handed the scroll of Isaiah. Um, and verse 17, unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because And this is from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom from the, for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So that is a prophecy from Isaiah, that's 60, Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2. That's what he reads from the scroll, uh, a very popular passage about the coming Messiah. And the Messiah, of course, we know Jesus is the Messiah, but they didn't know it yet. So it's interesting, the Messiah comes to the synagogue to read a, a passage about the Messiah. He's writing, he's reading a story about himself, right? People don't get this yet, but it's just very ironic. Then, okay, let, let me reread this. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He's talking about himself. Because he's anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is an incredible, hopeful passage for the Jewish people suffering under Roman oppression. And I'm sure they're sitting there saying, oh yeah, I love Isaiah 61. I can't wait for that day. Then, <laughs> verse 20. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. So that is what you would do. I, I don't know, this is just the vision I had. I imagine Jesus standing up front, that's the front of the, of the synagogue. Un, he's, he reads from the scroll. I also imagine a small scroll, not this massive thing that'd be laid on a table. But I imagine he rolled it up, handed it back, and then he walks back to his seat, you know? And he sits down and everybody, because then it says, and everybody looked at him. So I thought everybody's turning around like, who is this guy? That's not what happened. Where did he sit? In Moses' seat. So now it is saying, okay, I've read it to you. Now, I, as the teacher, I'm going to authoritatively tell you what this says. So, whatever your vision in mind is of Jesus then sat down, he didn't go back to his seat and, and sit next to his disciples. He sat in the seat of Moses, the seat of authority. He's about to tell us how important this passage is. So, it, he begins in verse, uh, verse 20, the middle of verse 20. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. Remember, he's the most, one of the most popular teachers. He's in Nazareth, the town. This is the good old boy, you know. You, you ever have, you, you ever have, so if you grew up in a small town and someone became famous from that small town, then everybody's telling everybody, oh yeah, this is where this person is from. You know, that's just kind of, this person went to my high school. Yeah, I knew him, you know. That's just kind of how it works. Um, and so Jesus is kind of, he's the popular boy. They like him, you know. Let's pat him on the head. Oh, Jesus is home. Everybody's talking about him around here. You know, it's a big deal. Because remember, don't forget, Nathaniel, one of his disciples said, does anything good come from Nazareth, right? So Nazareth, Nazareth is not this well-known town. It's not a throughway. It's an endpoint. It's a small town. So all of a sudden, they have something to brag about is Jesus. So they're looking at him, one of these most popular teachers. What are you going to say about the Messiah to inspire us? In verse 21, he began by saying to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That is a massive statement. What, what, what is he saying? This scripture is about me. What I just read is about me. I'm the promised Messiah. I'm here to give hope to God's people if you will receive it. But it's almost they didn't get what he's saying. So, verse 22 then says, All spoke well of him. We're amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They're saying, isn't this a nice young man? How impressive. Mom and dad must be proud. 
They're not hearing his words. They're not seeing his authority, but they're impressed and they like what he's saying. So Jesus decides to make it more clear. Verse 23, Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what we've heard you did in Capernaum. He's telling them, You're proud of me now, but there will be a day soon you'll be mocking me. It, it had to get quiet and tense in the room. And he goes after them. Verse 24, Truly I tell you, he's sitting in the authority seat of Moses. Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. He's saying, you don't, you're proud of me, but you're not proud of me for who I am. You do not accept me for who I really am. Um, stop your nice words about me. You don't get it. And then, if that wasn't offensive enough, we get to verse 25. I assure you, there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time. But when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Uh, you can read that story in 1 Kings 17, but this would have been, this would have been a painful reminder to the Jews because this, we, we were by Mount Carmel uh, yesterday. When I pointed out that's the Mount Carmel region, that was the Elijah versus the prophets of Baal. And the story is that there was a, there was a, there was no rain for three and a half years. People were struggling. They couldn't, if you don't have rain, you don't, you don't have an irrigation system. You don't have crops. People are hungry, they're starving. And there's only one person that got a miracle during that time. And it was a Gentile in Sidon. It was outside of Israel. That's a painful reminder that God sent Elijah the prophet to someone outside of Israel. We're God's people. He should have sent them, he should have sent Elijah to one of us. Then verse 27, he follows that up with a second story. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Different prophet, it's Elisha now, not Elijah, same theme. Many people in Israel had diseases, but God had Elisha heal one person, Naaman, a Syrian, not a Jew. What's the point of this? Jesus is saying, if you don't respond to my message, then this message will go to Gentiles. And that is offensive, that is insulting, Jesus, you're supposed to be a rabbi. You know we're God's special people, and you're pretending that we're not accepting it, which we are. We showed up at the Sabbath. We showed up at the synagogue. Why are you saying this? And Jesus is saying, you don't get it, and the message is going to leave here, and it's going to go to Gentiles. Um, they had to be offended. We invite you to speak in our synagogues. You read this passage, and then you proclaim that you're the Messiah. Verse 28, all the people in the synagogue were furious when he heard this. They didn't get what Jesus was claiming in verse 21. They get it now. I'm a prophet of God. I'm the Messiah. And if you don't accept me, I'll go to the Gentiles. And they're saying, who do you think you are? The next statement is shocking. Verse 29. They got up, drove him out of town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. Uh, what just happened? He's sitting in the seat of Moses. Again, not this town. Uh, it's Nazareth, which is, you know, a, a, a miles from here, but this just gives us a good idea with the seat of Moses. They took him off of the seat. Uh, Nazareth is built on a hill. There's a there's a significant cliff. If you fall off of that, you may as well fall off of our bell. It's not going to end well. And they take him and they want to throw him off. Why? Because he's claiming to be the Messiah. Not only is it offensive, it's a capital punishment. You claim to be the Messiah, you deserve to die. So they take him to the cliff, it's now called uh, Mount of Precipice, and they go to throw him off. They were angry in verse 30, but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. But Jesus performs some kind of miracle and walks right through them without them killing him. It's the first time that we read of that they tried to kill him. It certainly will not be the last, and the last time they will succeed by God's set design and purpose and foreknowledge. But that happened. Uh, on a seat of Moses. Can you imagine them dragging a teacher off this authoritative seat, all the people marching out of the synagogue to kill him? Uh, when God spoke, they ignored him. And then when they finally understood what God said, they wanted to kill him. And Jesus wanted it to be very clear in this passage. This is who I am. Make a choice. I'm not a good old boy you pat on the head. Um, I am someone that demands something. And yes, I want to fulfill all the prophecies about the Messiah, but you will reject me. And so there'll be this empty space where the Jews are set aside and Gentiles will be brought in. For that, we're thankful. For them, they were offended. Uh, but Jesus was demanding allegiance. 
Jesus was demanding belief that he is the Holy One of God. He is the one that was promised. And it's just so sad and interesting that oftentimes, you know, we uh, in uh, Mark chapter 4, we read it for tomorrow in the daily Bible reading that that the, the man that was healed uh, over in the garrison, he's over in the Decapolis on the, on the east side of the lake. He says, you are the Holy One of God. Uh, it was often Gentiles who recognized who Jesus was before the Jewish people. And I just pray, us as followers of God, we don't allow our minds to be blind to who God is and what He is doing. And that we don't allow ourselves simply to fall into the habits of tradition. That this is just what we do. That we forget what it is all about. Is seeing, admiring, uh, noticing, marveling, learning about, and serving Jesus and giving our all for Him. And it's, it is so easy, when, especially those who've known Christ for a long time. I, I used to do I used to do a, a talk with teenagers when I when I was a youth pastor, uh, or when I go speak at youth things, and I I talked about the dangers of second generation Christianity. Uh, maybe you've seen this that sometimes someone who comes to Christ as an adult, their life has been so radically transformed that everything is different about that person. And sometimes in that second generation, it's just all they knew. They, I, we grew up this way. And the things of God and the things of Christ aren't as special as it was to the person that was far from God, who was blind and now they see. They were lost, but now they're found. And they never lost that energy. But sometimes when you grow up in Christianity, you can just take it for granted. And there's a danger. There's an incredible blessing in having parents that are believers and grandparents that are believers and great-grandparents that are believers. And there can be an incredible danger because we can stop looking and seeing and learning and knowing and just take it all for granted. And I, I pray that the, the lesson of Luke 4 for us would be that we would be more like the Gentiles told in the story or the Gentile who what, demons were thrown out of him, that recognized who Jesus was, worshiped, believed, followed, rather than just being habitual people that show up at church and do our thing. Um, May God cause us to see him clearly so we can worship him fully and know him better. I think that's, for me, the lesson of Luke chapter 4.